border showdown. President Trump announces new measures to try to stop the flow of migrants coming toward the U.S. We're at the White House. Weekend trip. Pope Francis is back in Rome after a quick visit to Morocco. What he said about relations between Catholics and Muslims. Biden and the unborn. The former vice president is weighing whether to run for the White House in 2020. We look at his views on abortion. And lone survivor. While in Morocco, the Holy Father went out of his way to greet one Trappist monk. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, April 1st, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump takes steps to cut U.S. aid money from Central America. Citizens from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras are fleeing north, and the administration wants those countries to do more to stop undocumented immigrants from coming to the U.S. This weekend, Pope Francis warned that political leaders who want to build walls to keep out migrants, quote, end up prisoners of the walls that they build. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. President Trump has long called for a border wall, and now, despite the possible economic repercussions, he is even threatening to shut down the U.S. southern border, saying that detention areas there for holding migrants have reached max capacity. We have run out of space. We can't hold people anymore, and Mexico can stop it so easily. President Trump is moving ahead with his plan to stop sending money to countries that allow migrants to flee to America. Over the weekend, the State Department notified Congress it's looking to suspend federal aid to El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. We have right now two big caravans coming up from Guatemala, massive caravans walking right through Mexico. So Mexico is tough. They can stop them, but they chose not to. Now they're going to stop them. And if they don't stop them, we're closing the border. Back in October, as thousands of Central American immigrants trekked to the southern border, President Trump first teased the idea of slicing aid to their home countries. At the time, we asked him how doing so would prevent migrants from fleeing to the U.S. If you cut aid to Central America, won't that cause more migrants to... I can't tell you. I can only tell you this. We give them hundreds of millions of dollars. They do nothing for us. How will cutting aid keep migrants from coming up to the... Maybe it will and maybe it won't. Mr. It President. has it affected. They could do a lot better job. Democrats say the number of migrants heading to the border will increase since less aid money to Central America will broadcast more of a reason for people to flee poverty and violence. It's like a commercial to get people to come to the United States. Cutting off aid is going to make the situation much worse, much more chaotic, and these numbers are only going to grow. And Lauren, the president's threat to shut down the border could include stopping trade with Mexico. That's something the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says would be an economic debacle. The chamber reports the U.S. and Mexico trade nearly $1.7 billion in goods daily, and closing the border would threaten 5 million American jobs. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. Welcome back. Joe Biden is defending himself after a woman said he made her uncomfortable during a campaign appearance when he was vice president. He says he never meant to make Democrat Lucy Flores uncomfortable when in 2014 he kissed the back of her head and smelled her hair. Now eyeing a run for the presidency, Biden's out to show he's in step with the Democratic Party on key issues, including abortion. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi has more. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Joe Biden once criticized Roe v. Wade. Then later, he supported it. The former Delaware senator voted for the partial birth abortion ban. But his last National Right to Life scorecard lists the Catholic lawmaker with a 0% pro-life voting record. Liberals are asking, is Joe Biden liberal enough? I have the most progressive record of anybody running. But that wasn't always his story. Flashback to 1974, a year after Roe v. Wade. He told the Washingtonian magazine, I don't like the Supreme Court decision on abortion. I think it went too far. I don't think that a woman has the sole right to say what should happen to her body. Over the years, his abortion record has been mixed. The 1981 Biden amendment mandates U.S. foreign aid cannot be used to pay for research related to abortion. And this is National Right to Life scorecard from 1983 to 88. The X's are times Biden voted with the pro-life group. 
the O's or times he voted against them. He did vote in 1995 and 2003 to ban partial birth abortions, but National Right to Life says Biden never voted with them again. In a 2007 debate, he said he strongly supports Roe v. Wade. And on the 2012 VP debate stage, Joe Biden faced Paul Ryan. I accept my church's position on abortion as a, what we call, de fide doctrine. Life begins at conception, that's the church's judgment. I accept it in my personal life. But I refuse to impose it on equally devout Christians and Muslims and Jews. And uh, I just refuse to impose that on others. I don't see how a person can separate their public life from their private life or from their faith. Our faith informs us in everything we do. My faith informs me about how to take care of the vulnerable, of how to make sure that people have a chance in life. For now, the campaign trail buzzes with questions about Biden's history of offering hugs and shoulder squeezes. Democratic White House contenders say Biden owes an answer. In a statement yesterday, the man leading the Democratic polls, Biden, says it was never his intention to make women feel uncomfortable. Lauren? It's fascinating, Jason, to see the continued progression of pro-abortion views he held. Thank you so much. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey. The Supreme Court rules that a case by Planned Parenthood against a pro-life center for medical progress can go forward. The center secretly recorded Planned Parenthood employees talking about selling aborted baby body parts. The justices joined lower courts today in allowing Planned Parenthood's racketeering and other claims against the center to proceed. The center and its founder, David DeLayden, who recorded the videos, are also facing other criminal charges in California. The largest abortion provider in the country denied wrongdoing, and the center's lawyers say that they will carry on their fight to protect their clients' First Amendment rights. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo applauded the U.S. military this morning for its success against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And he said that while the ISIS caliphate has been taken down, the work for American leadership and our coalition partners is far from over. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has more from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary Mike Pompeo says it's key the State Department and the Defense Department work together in Syria and Iraq. Both of those countries are still rebuilding after years of ISIS control. The secretary telling members of the military they need to make sure terrorism cannot thrive in the region again. We are engaged in the fight, as I know you are, countering the ideology which drove that caliphate. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo telling members of the military it's vital the U.S. stay engaged in fighting terrorism in the Middle East. He spoke this morning at the Army War College in Pennsylvania, explaining how State Department diplomats are working in war-torn Syria. I have officers on the ground today in Syria uh, playing a role, a crucial role, uh, distributing foreign aid, working to uh, rebuild, working to develop a diplomatic resolution that will create a more stable Syria. His remarks come just over a week after the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces announced all of ISIS territory in their country has been liberated. The White House says the 2,000 American troops stationed in the country are beginning to leave, but President Trump has agreed to let 400 stay. The president of neighboring Iraq says despite the recent military victories, ISIS remains a danger. We still have lots of extremists around. Uh, there are remnants of ISIS that are still in operating or moving around in certain areas of Syria. And we also are intercepting intelligence that at least few are also operating in the desert areas of Iraq. Christians in the Nineveh Plains remain one of the most vulnerable groups. Their ancient homeland was nearly wiped out after ISIS invaded northern Iraq in 2014. Members of the Iraqi government say it will take decades to rebuild and will cost tens of billions of dollars. Right now, reports estimate only 2% of the region has been rebuilt. The State Department and Catholic groups have continued to highlight the plight of religious minorities like Christians and Yazidis. One other problem officials are dealing with is the thousands of prisoners captured in the fighting. Officials here ideally say they want to send all the foreign fighters back to their home countries in order to face trial. Lauren? Right, that statistic, 2% has been rebuilt. That is, that's unfortunate. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. The only Catholic diocese in South Carolina releases the names of 42 priests with ties to the state who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse. All but 11 have died. 
The head of the Diocese of Charleston says he released the names with a heavy heart, but he also wants accountability and transparency. Speaking on his way back to Rome from Morocco, meeting with Muslims, the Holy Father called for a humane resolution to the migration crisis, and he addressed the media on issues related to the church's sex abuse crisis. EWTN Rome Bureau Chief Alan Holdren reports. Pope Francis defended his decision to reject French Cardinal Philippe Barbarin's resignation after he was convicted of covering up for an abuser priest. The Holy Father said his appeal must run its course before a final decision is made. He also explained why he rejected proposals by U.S. bishops to respond to the sex abuse scandal there. He says they neglected the spiritual dimension required for a true reform. Francis referred to both cases on his way back from Morocco Sunday. The goal of the trip? To promote greater fraternity between Christians and Muslims. Pope Francis and Moroccan King Mohammed VI signed a call for Jerusalem to be preserved as a symbol of peaceful coexistence and for Muslims, Jews and Christians to be allowed to worship there freely. During the weekend trip, the Holy Father also celebrated Mass with the tiny Catholic community. Catholics represent less than 1% of Morocco's population. The Pope encouraged them to resist the temptation to sow division and instead remember we are brothers and sisters. Morocco has up to 6,000 homegrown converts to Christianity. Converts often have mass celebrated privately in their homes and hide their religion for fear of arrest. In a speech to Muslims Saturday, the Holy Father urged Morocco to move beyond freedom of worship to true respect for an individual's faith. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EW10 News Nightly. Venezuela's president announces a month-long plan to ration electricity. Nationwide power outages have inflicted misery on millions of people in the socialist country. They've also led to widespread protests. President Nicolas Maduro says it will be necessary to cut off water and communications for days at a time, and he warns against any unrest in reaction to the plan. A Catholic church in Michoacan, Mexico, is full of bullet holes after a deadly battle last week between rival drug cartels. While the pastor was not at St. Joseph the Worker Parish, drug traffickers stole money and the priest's personal possessions. In an interview with EWTN's Asi Prensa, the priest said he does not plan to abandon his ministry. Tens of thousands of demonstrators marched through Verona, Italy this weekend to protest pro-life and pro-family meetings. The protesters took issue in particular with the pro-life position. Speakers included the Archbishop of San Francisco and other religious leaders. The Vatican kept its distance with Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin saying, we agree on the substance, but not on the mode. Coming up. On its opening weekend, a pro-life movie really delivers. And analysis of a recent poll with encouraging numbers in the fight for the unborn. The pro-life movie Unplanned opened this past weekend with unexpected success. It finished in the top five at the box office and nearly tripled its expected earnings. Rough day at the office. You can say that. The film tells the story of Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood clinic director who became a pro-life supporter. Over the weekend, the movie earned an estimated $6.1 million. It's another success for Pure Flix, which targets faith-based audiences. Tonight, we take a closer look at new polling that indicates an overwhelming majority of New York State residents oppose late-term abortions. The new Marist poll, sponsored in partnership with the Knights of Columbus, found 71 percent of New York State residents say abortion should be banned after 20 weeks except to save the life of the mother. 20 percent say abortion should be allowed up any time up until birth. Joining me now by Skype from Poughkeepsie, New York, is Dr. Barbara Carvalho, director of the Marist Poll. Barbara, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you very much for having me. New York has been in the spotlight since Governor Cuomo's signing of the state's Reproductive Health Act into law. It removed nearly all restrictions on abortion and permits abortion up until the moment of birth, if necessary, to preserve the health of the mother. 
Were you surprised at the disconnect between New York lawmakers and their constituents on this issue of late-term abortion? Well, you know, we have been working with the Knights of Columbus over the past decade, actually, asking these questions nationally. And as you mentioned, New York is one state of several states around the country who have changed the laws to allow uh, third trimester abortions. And what we have found both nationally and, I think you're right, su somewhat surprisingly in New York, is that there really is a discomfort and a distaste um, for allowing abortion up and through the third trimester. Um, although 62 percent of New Yorkers do see themselves and consider themselves as pro-choice, almost half of those people, those people who actually identify as pro-choice, uh, do say that they really do not agree with having um, abortion legal beyond the first trimester, except, of course, to save the life of the mother. It's clear that New Yorkers seem to be more liberal when it comes to these restrictions than the rest of the country. So let me ask you this. What impact do you think media attention and this discussion about late-term abortions in New York and in other places is having on the hearts and minds of people? Well, you know, it's interesting, and we particularly look at uh, age and millennials, and I think millennials up until this point really haven't heard, you know, a pro-choice, pro-life discussion which involves these late-term abortions. They're a little bit too young to have been part of a lot of the debate for those, for those other laws. And so I think what we find is actually a consensus overall that once you start talking about abortion and laws which allow abortion abortion, other than to save the life of the mother, beyond the first trimester, you really see that there is a consensus and the majority of Americans and the majority of New Yorkers feel that that is really going beyond the pale. We just heard about the movie Unplanned and its success at the box office. Your thoughts on that? I, I think I think that it's, it is very interesting. I mean, when people talk about the idea of choice. Um, the choice is about health. The choice is about life. Um, it, it's not as narrow as what the debate has been discussing. And so I don't, forget, I don't find it surprising that when we talk the specifics about abortion, that Americans and New Yorkers have very different views than what, you, what is often perceived as the debate in the, in, the, in the public realm and by the media. Dr. Barbara Carvalho, thank you so much for joining us, director of the Marist Poll. Thanks for having me. A heartbeat bill in Georgia is headed to the governor's desk. The proposal would ban abortion once a baby's heartbeat is detected sometime after six weeks. Republican Governor Brian Kemp supported the measure in its initial stages. State lawmakers approved the measure by one vote. Up next, the former CEO and presidential candidate is set to help students at a Catholic university. And why a 95-year-old monk received a greeting from the Holy Father. The lights at Brazil's iconic Christ the Redeemer statue flipped off Saturday night. It was part of Earth Hour, where buildings around the world, including New York, went dark in a call for global action on climate change. A former CEO and presidential nominee is lending her expertise to the Catholic University of America. CUA has appointed Carly Fiorina, former CEO of Hewlett Packard and 2016 Republican presidential nominee, as its distinguished clinical professor in leadership at the Bush School of Business. And joining me now to talk more about that program is Michael Pakaluk. Acting Dean of the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. Did I get that right? Uh, I say Pakalik. You say Pakalik. I say Pakalik. Yeah, I think okay. it's actually Pakaluk in <laughs> Ukraine. Uh, okay. Who cares? But we digress. <laughs> Let's talk about Carly Fiorina. She was a woman who worked her way up, as we learned during this 2016 run that she had from secretary to becoming the first woman to lead a Fortune 50 company. So, how is her unique perspective going to strengthen and prepare? business students for careers in business. Well, first of all, she's a remarkable person, as you say, and she's energizing. Just to be in the same room with Carly, it's remarkable. 
and then she has tremendous sympathy or, or admiration for the Catholic intellectual tradition. So when she gave a speech at Stanford University, I think she was commencement speaker, she said her favorite course in college wasn't poli-sci or economics. It was a course, advanced course in medieval philosophy. Her absolute well, that sounds course. right up your alley, doesn't yes, it, exactly. right? The university prides itself on being faithfully Catholic, and she is a pro-life Christian. So what role is this new partnership going to play in supporting the mission of the business school? Well, she has this great unlocking potential leadership program, and she believes that leaders are made, they're not born, and that everyone has a potential for leadership. And that, in a, really attractively, leadership is shown at the level of where you're closest to. So not people who are distant, but close to what they're leading. And that's very similar to the Catholic notion of subsidiarity. Bef but we also want to talk about the role of the human person in yeah. all of this. And how does the Bush School's emphasis on that part of Catholic social teaching help them be more f effective? Well, it all starts from the dignity of the human person and really the golden rule seeing things from the point of view of the other person and dealing with the other as you would like to be dealt with. But that's hard in business when everything is focused on the bottom line. I mean, she was running a Fortune 50 company. Yeah, it's hard, but it can be done, and it leads to better business practices. And how, that's, how so? Well, because people respond when they're treated with dignity and respect, mm -hmm. and you get buy-in, and people want to work hard, and they respect leadership, mm -hmm. and that, those are all good things. Okay, before we go, not only are you acting dean, but you also wrote this book, The Memoirs of St. Peter. You didn't write it, really. I mean, there's a commentary, but it is a new translation of the gospel according to Mark. Okay, how did you do that? How did you translate, get a new translation? I'm, I'm assuming you've got a little background in Greek. Yeah, I've read Greek for many years, and I'm a classical scholar, and um, I'm an expert in Aristotle and his ethics. But what this translation does is it, it's based on the idea that, as the early church said, the Gospel of Mark is, are the memoirs of St. Peter, that Mark actually took down Peter's preaching. So in the translation, it's a very accurate translation, I try to capture the, the sense of a spoken uh, language. So you read it and you, you can almost hear St. Peter speaking in the translation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Great to be on the show. Pack of luck. <laughs> Next time. I'm, 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 Next I'm time. kidding. Because... Three syllabi in three different shows. <laughs> That's right. Acting Dean of the Bush School of Business. <laughs> Thank you. A Catholic priest in Mexico, or rather in Canada, it was a terrible story, I was uh, stabbed while celebrating Mass, but he says he has forgiven his attacker. I do not think this person has anything personally against me. and. As far as I'm concerned, I have no resentment towards that person. On the contrary, I feel he's a person who needs help, and I'm sure he will find the help he needs, and I pray the Lord that you will assist him in this progress. Unbelievable. Father Claude Grew also says he wanted to continue celebrating Mass after the attack. He spent a few days in the hospital and was then released. Finally, tonight, Pope Francis pays his respects to a very special French monk while in Morocco. <laughs> Father Jean-Pierre Schumacher is the last surviving member of a monastery that endured a brutal massacre during the Algerian Civil War. Seven French Trappist monks who died in it were beatified this past December, a step towards sainthood. Father Jean-Pierre is 95 years old. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.